In the year 1824, I, Mr. William Rashley of Menabilly in Cornwall, had certain alterations made to my house. The architects noticed that the buttress against the northwest corner of the house served no useful purpose. When the masons demolished it, they came upon a stair leading to a small room. Here they found the skeleton of a young man seated on a stool, dressed in the clothes of a cavalier as worn during the period of the Civil War in the 17th century. The King's General by Daphne du Maurier. Dramatized for radio by Michelin Wandor. With Catherine Harrison as Honor Harris, Roger Allen as Richard Grenville, Carolyn Pickles as Matty, and Philip Sully as Robin. Give me your hand. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, no. It's all right, Miss Honor. I'm here. It's all right. Oh, I was dreaming, Matty. Oh. Shall I rub your back? Please, Matty. There, now. Autumn always was your bad time. Remember, Miss Honor is indisposed and can see no one today. <laughs> indisposed. More like black despair. Well, the war is over now. Not for long. In a year or so, we'll have another rising and there'll be more blood spilt and more hearts broken. And perhaps Sir Richard will return. And quarrel with everyone, friend or foe. Even so, you will be glad to see him again. Oh, God, confound and damn these Grenvilles. They harm everything they touch. They always did. From the first moment I met them... A little honour. I'm Gartred. Say how do you do to me? Why is your hair so red? Auburn, my dear. All the Grenvilles have auburn hair. But you are called Harris now. I love my brother Kit more than you possibly can. Then I hope you will grow to have manners as good as his. Kit! I say Kit, darling! And so I learned that marriage was not the romantic fairy legend I'd imagined it to be. A great institution. A bargain between important families, the tying up of property. Next year, the smallpox swept through Cornwall. In June, my father and Kit both died. After the will was read, Gartred packed her things, taking with her all the jewellery my brother had given her. I was glad to see the back of her. My 18th birthday, a bright December day. My brother Robin took me to a banquet to celebrate the arrival of His Majesty's fleet in Plymouth Sound. Make way for the Duke of Buckingham. Curtsy, Honour. Curtsy? How on earth? Your Grace. Oh, Lord. Your Grace. Would you care to let me show you how to do that? Your performance was quite lamentable. How dare you speak to me like that? Honour, really. Sir Richard, this is my sister. Honour. Sir Richard Grenville, a colonel in His Majesty's army, knighted for extreme gallantry in the field. It is a pity that your manners do not match your courage. Do excuse us, Sir Richard. May I take your sister in to dinner, Mr. Harris? Certainly not. Well, uh, yes, of course. Come along, my dear. Let go of me. We're in company. Smile. You... So you're the little maid my sister so much detested. What the hell do you mean? I would have had you spanked for it. You are a spoilt little baggage. Now behave. <laughs> More wine? But... Don't tell me you do not drink wine. Uh, I have not really ever... Then now is your chance. Your very good health, my dear Miss Harris. <sighs> well, my dear little one, I owe you an apology. I feel sick. Lie still. This cold cloth will soothe your head. Oh, thank you. I like you better now. It's a shame that I had to make you vomit before I won your approval. <laughs> oh, my God, that food. Roast swan is an acquired taste. 
I don't think you are at all like your sister. Gartrid is a law unto herself. I hate her. Is she content now that she is wed again? Gartrid will never be content. She was born greedy. <laughs> you have been very kind to me. I have never disgraced myself so before a man. And I have never sat with a woman before while she vomited. Oh, dear. Nor have I ever been in a darkened room with anyone so fair as you, Honor, and not made love to her. And then the wooing began. Keep still. The branch will not hold us both. It's ten feet to the ground. Oh, I shall fall. Then lean against me and keep still. We cannot possibly converse in such a fashion. Why not? I find it very pleasant. There. That's better. My mother says you are a person of ill repute. How so? You are constantly in debt. The Grenvilles are always in debt. You are a sore trial to your family. On the contrary, it is they who are a sore trial to me. I can seldom get a penny out of them. Oh, dear. You have an earwig running down your bosom. What? Oh, please, get it away from me. Hold still or we'll both fall. There. It's gone now. You took advantage of me. Will you tell your mother? I shall tell my mother nothing. Oh, Richard, you are making me fall in love with you. March and April afternoons, bees humming above our heads, the black caps singing, the grass in the orchard growing longer by day. No end, no beginning to these afternoons. Honor, I must talk to you. What is it, Robin? Great happiness is in store for you, my dear Honor. Oh, I do hope so. Edward Champernow has asked for your hand in marriage. What? Mother and I have accepted. What do you think? I cannot possibly wed a man not of my own choice. I would sooner die. What do you want? Good God, honour. Oh, Richard, they want me to marry Edward Champernown, and I told them I would not. And you tramped 12 miles to tell me that. Oh, honour, my little love. I'm so tired, Richard. I have some news that will wake you up. I have sold Killigarth. What? But why? To pay my debts. It will suffice till we can borrow elsewhere. We? But what if my brother refuses his permission? I'll fight him. My dowry will be very small. Don't be stupid, my love. It is your person I have designs on. Now, come into breakfast. The scandal of my conduct spread. It was said I had eloped with Richard Grenville and was to wed him through dire necessity. He had shamed me in Plymouth, carried me by force to Killygarth, where I lived as his mistress. But finally, when all the fuss had died down, I was to be married from the Grenville home, and there I met Gartred again. Richard! Gartred, welcome. Have you come for the hunt? I have. How are you, Honor? Well enough. I never thought to see you become a Grenville. Nor I. Where do we ride, Richard? Towards the shore. Your hawk is not in her full plumage. Do you think to make anything of her? We shall see. And Honor, will she ride with us? Of course. Well, well. We shall see if she can keep up with the Grenvilles. Richard! 
Within seconds, the two hawks are like black specks in the sky above them. My horse, excited by the noise, takes charge of me, nearly pulling my arms out of their sockets. The sun in my eyes, the wind in my face, the thunder of the hooves, the scent of the golden gorse, the sound of the sea. There! The heron! See, Richard! The hawks have seen the quarry. They circle above the heron, climbing higher and higher till they are like black dots against the sun. One dives, then the other. My horse takes flight. Richard! Help me! Oh, the heron is now directly above my head. Richard! Gartred, which way is the marsh? Honor, hold on! Break ahead, Honor! The sun blinds me. The dying heron and the bloody falcon fall straight to the earth. And so it was that I, Honor Harris of Lanrest, became a cripple, losing all power in my legs from that day forward. I lived for many weeks in a state of darkness. When I recovered, I learned that the Duke of Buckingham had been assassinated at Portsmouth and Richard had set sail for France with his regiment. By the time he returned, I had made my decision. Dear Richard, after all that has happened, I cannot see you again. Honour Harris. Richard rode down from London, but I refused to see him. Eventually he gave up trying and left. Sometime later, I received a letter from him. My dear Miss Harris, I have to inform you that in November of this year, I plan to marry Lady Howard of Fitzford, a rich widow, three times wed already and four years older than myself. Three years passed. My back had strengthened so that I could sit upright. In winter, the damp settled in my bones and I felt terrible pain. Robin made me a chair with rolling wheels so that I could move about with greater ease. In 1632, my sister Mary married Jonathan Rashley of Menabilly. News came that Richard had a son, but all was not well with his marriage. He has quarrelled with his wife, laid violent hands upon her, so she says. She is petitioning for a divorce. Richard, violent? Irresponsible and wild, perhaps, Robin, but nothing worse. She must have provoked him. No one knows the truth. Then I heard no more of him. By 1642, when the war that was to alter all our lives broke forth, I was a woman of some two and thirty years. Jonathan Rashley brought the news that was to shatter our peaceful lives. There is trouble coming upon us. Cornwall is so divided, Jonathan. Some hold that His Majesty is justified in passing what laws he pleases. Everyone grumbles at the taxes. Well, I am for the King. It will be civil war, Robin. We shall have to raise money. Troops and ammunition for the royal cause. For generations we have lived at peace here. How can we fight our neighbours? We must sacrifice whatever is necessary for the cause. But Cornwall is not a wealthy county. God knows our leaders want nothing in courage, but they lack experience and equipment. We shall see. In the third week of January, the army of Parliament crossed the Tamar into Cornwall. My kind, gentle Robin arrived home triumphant, covered in dust, a blood-stained bandage on his arm. I tell you, they started taking to their heels before we'd spent our powder. And they say that Richard Grenville is to return from Ireland to join us. Uh, this summer we'll see the rebels in Parliament laying down their arms forever. His Majesty the King is Master of the West. Now, Honour, you must leave Lanrest and go to stay with Mary at Manabilly. Uh, you will be much safer there. Honour, my dear, I have put you in the gatehouse. There is light and air, and the chamber looks both ways over the outer courtyard and the inner courtyard. Thank you, Mary, you are kind. Matty can sleep in the chamber on the right. The chamber to your left is empty. Jonathan goes there sometimes. It was his brother John's room. I shall be very comfortable. I'll leave you to settle in. I'll bring you some tea. Will you be comfortable here, Miss Honour? Of course. Will you? 
I think so. I've already made friends with the cooks. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Do you know anything of the empty apartment next door to this? It is a lumber room, they tell me. Mr Rashley is the only one with a key. Can you look through the keyhole? Oh, yes. It's dark. I can see nothing. There must be some gap in the wood where we can scrape a wide enough crack. Use my knife. Well... Go on, Matty. I'm curious. There. What can you see? A plain chamber, much the same as this, with a bed in one corner and hangings on the walls. Oh, dear. I hoped at least for a heap of treasure. Thank you, Matty. What shall I do about the hole? Move that picture to hang over it. Is everything to your liking? Yes, thank you, Mary. Excuse me, I must see about dinner. We shall have some tea. And uh, I have something to tell you. Oh? There is a new commander expected here. Why should that concern me? It is Sir Richard Grenville. Richard? Your tea? He is to raise troops for the king and be in command of the siege at Plymouth. I see. And what do the men think of their new commander? Oh, as a soldier, they admire him. And as a man? They say once an injury is done to him, he will never forget or forgive. It doesn't concern me, Mary. <laughs> they say he seized his wife's property and took all the money owed by the tenants for his own use. I thought he was divorced. He is divorced. He's not entitled to a penny from the property. What happened to his son? He is with his father. Mary, it was all a long time ago. Well, I thought you should know that he's a mere 30 miles away. He may come here. Let him. I don't care. I'm only interested in getting to know my new home. Menabini lies in a kind of a saucer. Apparently the house was so built that it should not be seen from the sea. They say old Mr Rashley was a bit of a pirate. They say bales of silk and bars of silver were stolen from the French and hidden in the house. What's this building? Oh, just a summer house. Shall we look in? Please. Musty. Books, papers, a desk. Not much sign of piracy here, Matty. Very neat. Jonathan is methodical. The view from here is wonderful, Miss Anna. Look! What on earth? Matty, come here. What is it? Here, under this rug. Come on, help me. Well, well. A ring in the flagstone. Can you lift it? I'll, I'll try. It's coming. Did you see that, Matty? A flight of steps. There must be a tunnel beneath the flagstone. An incoming vessel anchored in deep water could send a boat ashore. The men could climb up the path to the summer house. It is possible that those bales of silk and bars of silver were stored beneath the flagstones. I wonder... What? There could be a secret entrance to Menabilly, perhaps in the chamber next to mine under the causeway. Perhaps that is why it is permanently locked. Your imagination's running away with you, Miss Arno. And what have we here? My God. Well, now. Mistress Harris, I believe. Yes, yes. Not the beautiful Mistress Honor Harris. Do not mock me, Richard. I did not know that you were at Menabilly. My brother said I must not live alone at Lanrest while the war continues. He showed wisdom. Essex is moving westwards all the time. It is very probable we shall see fighting once again this side of the Tamar. I leave you, Miss Honor. Matty, as lovely as ever. I've nothing to say to you, Sir Richard. Oh, why is that? You know why. I don't. You deserted my mistress because of her crippled state. Matty! Is that what you believe? It does not matter what I believe. Wonderful. Congratulations, Honor, on having so fierce a bodyguard. Matty, please take Miss Honor back to the house and bring dinner for two to her room. It has been a long time. Have I altered? Oh, yes. You are broader. A white streak in your auburn hair. Lines beneath your eyes. Well, 
I should not have expected compliments. Your eyes are quite unchanged. Your health and fortune, Miss Harris. Forgive me, I had not thought after 15 years to find you so damnably unchanged. Damnably? I had thought of you as an invalid, wan and pale, hedged about with doctors and attendants. <laughs> I am sorry to disappoint you. I have not said I was disappointed. Now I am to come into the West, I propose to visit frequently. I see. I am told Parliament has put a price on your head. Fools and rebels. They are only fighting for what they believe to be a better cause than ours. Their cause does not concern me. But unfortunately, their army is better organised than ours. You'd hardly credit how disorganised my men are. I've sacked more than half my officers. Where are you living? At Buckland Abbey. The tenants pay their rents to me or else they're hanged. Do you have your son with you? Yes, my spawn is somewhere about the place. What is he like? Dick? Oh, he's a little handful of a chap with mournful eyes. He's the spit of his goddamn mother. Did you never try to make a life of happiness? Happiness was not in question. That went with you. A fact that you refused to recognise. I am sorry. So am I. Had you no affection for her? None whatever. I wanted her money, that was all. You are very altered, Richard. If I am so, you know the reason why. Oh, Honor, your skin still smells the same. I remember you had a mole in the small of your back which gave you much distress. You thought it ugly, but I liked it well. Is it not time that you went downstairs to join your officers? I tell you, Honor, I care not two straws for your civility. Fifteen years can go whistling down the wind. Are you still queasy when you eat roast swan? <laughs> oh, it's a long time since I ate roast swan. Beloved Halfwit, with your goddamn pride, do you understand now that you blighted both our lives? I understood that at the time. Why, then, in the name of heaven, did you do it? Had I not done so, you would soon have hated me. That is a lie, Honor. Mm, perhaps. My marriage is annulled. I'm free to wed again. Then do so to another heiress. I have no need of an heiress now, with all the estates in Devon to my plunder. You can have any bride you choose. I want you. No, Richard. Why? Because I will not have you wedded to a cripple. Is it because there can never be between us what there was once? Yes. It will make no difference. It would, after a little while. But we can never stop loving each other, can we? I don't know, Richard. Do you have much pain? Oh, sometimes, when the air is damp. Can nothing be done for it? Matty rubs my back and legs with lotion, but it is of little use... The bones were all smashed and they cannot knit together. Will you show me, Honor? Oh. Please. You will be the only person in the world to see me so, except Matty and the doctors. Whatever you suffer, you shall share with me. Will you promise never to send me from you again? I, I cannot leave you. I shall lie in bed with you tonight. We shall be as we were. But we are not the same, Richard. I am. I have kissed your poor broken body, Honor. Who else would do that? If you show such gentleness with me, how is it that you show to others... Even to your son, a character at once so proud and cruel, so deliberately disdainful. I am a soldier, Honor. That is all I can say. Oh, Richard. Your faults are my faults. Your arrogance my burden. I cannot send you from me. You have made me very happy. That night, I was wakeful. I sat up in bed to drink a glass of water. As I replaced it, I became aware of a cold draught of air blowing from the empty room next door.
Who is it? Who is there? I will shout for help. Well. Well, so I am discovered. Oh, Jonathan. Thank goodness it is you. I had not thought to find your chamber occupied. You have understood, I suppose, that there is a secret entry to this chamber from the summer house? I guessed as much. I had better explain, but this is between us. I will be discreet. At the beginning of hostilities, I was appointed by His Majesty's Council to collect the silver plate and arrange for it to be taken to the Minter Trura to be melted down. All the transport has to be done at night, when the roads are quiet. But where is the treasure kept? This room is empty. The buttress in the corner of this room is hollow. A flight of narrow steps leads to a small room in the wall, where it is possible for a man to stand and sit, though it is but five feet square. This room is connected with a tunnel, which runs under the house, beneath the causeway to the summer house. Ah, oh, I see. I need hardly tell you that not a word of what has this night passed between us must be revealed to anyone. Richard's presence brought the strategy of war right into our lives. The Western army is useless. If Essex chooses to march west, there is nothing to stop him except a mob of sick men and a handful of drunken generals. That is terrible. It will be a good thing. If we can but draw him into Cornwall, the narrow lanes and high hedges will befog him completely and we will have him surrounded. The country will be devastated. The land is too poor to feed an army. With all due respect, you Cornishmen are fools. You may know your cattle and pigs, but for God's sake, leave the art of war to professional soldiers like myself. You are prepared to see Cornwall laid waste, people homeless, and much sickness and suffering spread abroad? But if you cannot suffer a little for the king's cause, then we may as well surrender forthwith. I will not sit here and listen to such insults. Oh, Richard... Never mind him. I have something more important on my mind. Mm, what is that? If Essex draws near and I'm forced to raise the siege of Plymouth, can I send the whelp to you? <laughs> the whelp? I did not know you had a dog. I mean my pup, my son and heir. Will you have him here under your wing? Well, yes, indeed, if you think he would be happy with me. He's the wrong age for me, 14 too big to dandle and too small to talk to. <laughs> I would not like to have you as a father. Rubbish. Dick is a coward. Weeps at the slightest scratch. I shall love him because he is your son. The following evening, I arrived back in my chamber to find a white shrimp of a boy with great dark eyes and tight black locks. I think you must be Honour. Father said I was to be with a lady who was beautiful. Why do you sit in that chair? Because I cannot walk. I have hurt my legs. Does it hurt much? No. I'm used to it. I never heard my mother speak of you. I do not know your mother, Dick. I only know your father. Do you like him? Why do you ask? I hate him. I wish he would be killed in battle. Why do you hate him? He tried to kill my mother. He tried to steal her house and money and then kill her. And he took me away from her. He's a devil. Perhaps when the war is finished you will go back to her. Last week I saw a wounded man brought into the house upon a stretcher. There was blood. I cannot bear blood. My mother told me that once my father came into the room and quarrelled violently with her and struck her on the face. And she bled. The blood ran on my hands. We won't talk about it anymore, Dick. From that day forward, Dick became my shadow. He arrived with my breakfast. He sat beside me in the dining chamber and walked beside my chair on the causeway. He would curl on the floor beside me when I read. But he did not remain with me for long. My sweet love. The hook is nicely baited. Essex will be in Bodmin at night, and most probably in Foy tomorrow. We shall come up on them from Truro, and His Majesty and his troops from the east. I shall be moving on, and it may be best if you return the whelp to me. Send him down to the beach with Matty. 
a fishing boat will take him to St Moore's. Oh, Miss Anna! Matty, what is it? We were all assembled on the beach and the boat was launched. There was a little space below deck and with my own eyes I saw Dick descend into it, his bundle under his arm. Just before they drew anchor, we could not find him. We searched the vessel from stem to stern, but he wasn't there. Oh, no! We called him and called him and, and then we went off to search for him. And? I gave up and was climbing the cliff and there he was. Thank you. God. Dripping wet and scratched about the face by brambles. He had been waist deep in water for three hours. Then I saw troops riding across the park. Oh, Matty. I remembered the summer house. I told Master Dick to follow the tunnel to the house and wait for you to give the signal from the chamber next door. Matty, how can I thank you? Come. We must go down to join the others. They must not suspect anything. Where is the owner of the house? My husband is from home, sir. Mary Rashley, at your service. Is everyone living in the place assembled here? They are. You have no malignants in hiding? None. Men, make a thorough search of the house and grounds. We will take over all the rooms on the ground floor. Why, I believe it is Lord Robart. Gartred, what are you doing here? I have come to seek sanctuary. Mm, this is a foolish time to journey, Mrs Dennis. You'd have done better to remain at Orley Court. It's not very pleasant for a widow with young daughters to live alone as I do. Well, you'll have to remain here in custody with Mrs. Rashley and her household. A pleasure, sir. Especially if you are in command. How dare she? Honour. Your keys, Mrs. Rashley. I shall take command of the kitchens. The estate is now the possession of the Parliament. What about milk for the children? If the children need more nourishment, you must do without yourselves. You may all go now. It's a pleasure to be here, Honor. I trust we shall meet soon. Not if I can help it, Gartred. Miss Harris, may I have a word with you? It seems you had living here until today the son of Richard Grenville. You were the boy's godmother and had the care of him, I understand. Where is he now? Somewhere off the coast, I hope. There is a heavy price upon Grenville's head. To harbour him or any of his family would count as treason to Parliament. In that case, you had better take Mrs. Dennis into closer custody. She is Sir Richard's sister. Mrs. Dennis has, I understand, little or no friendship with her brother. Her late husband, Mr. Anthony Dennis, was known to be a good friend of Parliament and an opposer of Charles Stuart. Have you nothing at all to tell me about your godson? Nothing at all. And now, if you will excuse me, I shall go to my room. I have brought you some pie and some water. It's all I can find. Shut the window, Matty. The smoke from the campfires is coming into the room. There. What's happening, Matty? They've taken all the linen and the silver. They're cutting down the trees in the orchard, and tomorrow they're to cut all the corn. It's only three weeks to harvest. So this really is war. They have rounded up all the cattle and driven them into the park, slaughtered three of them. I can't eat. You'd better eat. There's no use us starving before we have to. There's one other discovery I made. What's that, Matty? Mrs Dennis hasn't lost her taste for gentlemen. There was roast beef and burgundy taken up to Mrs Dennis and places set for two upon the tray. Who was the fortunate who dined with Mrs Dennis? Lord Robarts himself. I see. I might invite him to share cold pie with me one evening. Yeah, I'd like to see Sir Richard's face if you did. <laughs> Sir Richard would not mind, not if there was something to be gained from it. Matty, do you think it's safe to try and find Dick? I think so. The entrance must be somewhere near the buttress. Is there a ring in the stone under the rug in the corner? I'll see. No, I can't see any way of lifting the stone from this side. Oh, no. Poor Dick, waiting for a signal. Dick? Dick? It's no use. He can't possibly hear through the stone. Shh! Listen. Oh, Maddie, hurry, help him. Come on, then, Master Dick. Come on, give me your hand. Come. Dick! Oh. Are you all right? Oh, Anna. It's all right, Dick. You're safe now. 
I sat in the room below the steps for hours, but you didn't come. I wanted to turn back, but I didn't dare. Oh, Anna, it was so dark. Oh, sh- It's black as pitch and closer than a grave. Dick, you can stay here with me tonight, but tomorrow when it's light, you will have to go back to the cell and stay there during the day. How will he know when to come up? We will leave the stone open a little. We can wedge it on a piece of wood under the rug. I will strike a stick upon the floor twice as a signal that it is safe for you to come up. Very well. Three times means danger, and then the stone must be pulled flush to the wall. I suppose so. Good. Now that's settled. Are you hungry, Master Dick? Oh yes, Matty. Starving. For four whole weeks, the rebels were our masters. The first week was hot and stifling, with a glazed blue sky, the smell of horse flesh, and the stink of sweating soldiery. There was a battle yesterday on Braddock Down. They've lost a lot of men. Sir Richard has advanced with nearly a thousand troops from Truro and is coming up on Bodmin from the west. There's only soup and half a loaf of stale bread, I'm afraid. Thank you, Matty. Perhaps it will not be too long now. Am I disturbing you, Honour? The good Matty, always so devoted. What ease of mind a faithful servant brings. I do my duty. You have heard the news. That a skirmish was fought yesterday, that the king is near and that the rebels got the worst of it. Yes, I have heard that. Will that be all, Miss Honour? Yes, Matty. I'll be back later to help you to bed. Oh, if this business continues long enough, none of us will find it very pleasant. The men are already in an ugly mood. Defeat may turn them into brutes. Jack Robart is already as black as thunder. It is his own fault for advising the Earl of Essex to come into Cornwall and run 10,000 men into a trap. So it is a trap. And my unscrupulous brother, the baiter of it. I shudder to think of what Jack Robarts will do to Richard if he gets hold of him. The reverse holds equally true. Oh, all men are idiots, especially in wartime. They lose all sense of values. It depends upon the meaning of values. I value my own security. Neither for the Parliament nor for the King, but for Gartred Dennis. Your tongue hasn't blunted with the years. Tell me, do you still care for Richard? That is my affair. He's detested by his brother officers and loathed all over the West. You were spared intolerable indignities, you know, Honour, by not being his wife. You must be rather a new pastime, a woman who can't respond. How dare you! His treatment of Dick was really most distressing. I'm glad for the lad's sake that Jack Robarts did not find him here at Menabilly. He has sworn an oath to hang any relative of Richard's. Except yourself, I gather. <laughs> I don't count. Mrs Dennis of Orley Court is not the same as Gartred Grenville. My being here has spared you all so far from worse unpleasantness. I've known Jack Robarts for many years. Keep him busy, then. That's all I ask of you. I cannot guarantee that his good temper will continue. By the way... This is the room, isn't it, where they used to keep the idiot? I have no idea. There was some cupboard, I believe, where they used to shut him up when he grew violent. Have you discovered it? There are no cupboards here. If he loses the campaign, Jack Robarts will give orders to sack Menabilly and destroy everything. I am aware of that. He must be a curious man, Jonathan Rashley, to desert his home, knowing full well what will happen to it in the end. He knows what he's doing. Does he still act as collector for the mint? I cannot tell you anything, Gartred. But if you wait long enough for the house to be ransacked, you may come upon the silver you think he has concealed. I am tired now. Please leave me. Very well. We shall talk again. Good night, Honour.
A high, blustering wind, closed, dripping tents, horses tethered beneath the trees. Burial parties go forth at dawn, carrying the wounded who have died in the farm buildings. The rebels at Foy are cut off from their shipping in the channel and can receive no supplies by sea except from tiny boats. Essex and his troops are now pinned up in the peninsula, some seven miles long and two broad. This is Lord Robart's cook, Miss Anna. He has some information for you. It's all right. He's my friend. Lord Essex plans to retreat tonight. There'll be 5,000 troops. The boats will take them off when the wind eases. What will your generals do with their 2,000 horse? Well, there's talk of breaking through the royalist lines tonight when the foot retreat. I will tell you what will happen. The morning will come and there won't be any boats. In the driving wind and rain, with a thundering great southwest sea, the country people will come down from the cliffs with pitchforks. Cornish folk are not pleasant when they're hungry. What? Oh. Why don't you desert? I can give you a note to a royalist leader. If you go to the king's army and tell them what you have just told me, they'll give you more gold and a full supper into the bargain. Oh, I'll go. It has come to my knowledge that large quantities of silver, which should by rights belong to Parliament, are on the premises. I ask you, madam, to tell me where the silver is concealed. My husband was collector for Cornwall, that is true, my lord. But I know nothing about him concealing anything at Menabilly. Very well. Sack the house, strip the hangings and all furnishings, leave only the bare walls. I protest, my lord, in the name of common decency and humanity. What authority has Parliament given you to commit such wanton damage? My lord Robarts, I beg you, have mercy on us. <laughs> The smoke of the burning buildings is rank and bitter in the steady rain. The driving rain blows in upon our faces, soft and silent, carrying great flakes of charred timber and dull soot from the burning rubble. My orders have been carried out. There is nothing left within Menabilly House but yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, and the bare walls. Goodbye. The rebel army capitulated to the king in the early hours of Sunday morning. The war is not over for all the triumphs in the West. What is it all for? The land laid waste, houses devastated, hundreds of men killed. Gartred, like a true gambler, thinks it best to cut her losses and be quit of us. The aftermath of war, orchards devastated, Prisoners still lying in the ditches with dust and flies upon them, some without hands and feet, some hanging from trees. War can make beasts of us all. My brother Robin invited me to stay with him. Dick came with me. Honor. How good to see you. Robin. <laughs> Well, my dear, you've lost weight. So would you if you'd been held prisoner by the rebels for four weeks. I did not know you were here. Your brother is most hospitable. Joseph, mm -hmm. come and meet Honour. This is my kinsman, Joseph. Isn't he a fine fellow? God damn you, Richard. How do you do, Joseph? How do you do, madam? Uh, excuse me, General. General? The King's General in the West, at your service. Joseph, give me some tobacco. Here you are, Father. Thank you. Now, Honour, I will conduct you to your apartment. Good evening, gentlemen. Put me down, damn you! <laughs> All in good time. Now, immediately. Very well. <clears throat> Thank you. You're impossible, Richard. It is good to see you. I get very tired of the company of soldiers. There are plenty of women who could give you satisfaction. I have not met any. Bring them in from the hedgerows and send them back again in the morning. Ah, Joseph. Yes, ah, Joseph. Who is his mother? 
A dairy woman at Killigarth, a most obliging soul, married now to a farmer and mother to his children. You lived at Killigarth when you were courting me all those years ago. God damn it, I didn't write to see you every day. You were not the only woman in my life. Oh, get out. No. I cannot have the same contempt for my brother's house as you do. I did not come to Radford to put up with your bad manners. I have a very poor opinion of whatever else you came for. You have placed me in a most embarrassing position. Don't worry, sweetheart. I did that to you 16 years ago. I shan't leave, so you may as well be civil. How long will it take before Plymouth falls to you? They have the whole place strengthened since our campaign in Cornwall. And His Majesty has only given me a thousand men to do the job. You'll never take it by direct assault, then? Not unless I can increase my force by nearly another thousand. I'm already recruiting hard up and down the county, but the fellows must be paid. They won't fight otherwise, and I don't blame them. What will you do? Let me try and explain about military strategy. First of all, troops must be absolutely disciplined, on and off duty. Secondly, where might fails, subterfuge and bribery can succeed. What do you mean? Well, tonight I've made a gambler's throw. It may come off, it may be hopeless. If it succeeds, Plymouth can be ours by daybreak. Explain. I'm in touch with the second in command in the garrison. For the sum of £3,000, he may surrender the city. Before wasting further lives, I thought it worth my while to try bribery. I'm not as heartless as you believe. How will you manage it? Young Joseph will slip through the lines at sunset and will hide in the town. He bears my message to the colonel and a firm promise of £3,000. Suppose they catch Joseph. The lad is quite capable of looking after himself. Remember how much Lord Robarts detests the name of Grenville. You know that he sacked Menabilly simply and solely because you had pillaged his estate. He is an extremely dull-witted fellow. There is not a pin to choose between you where pillaging is concerned. The Royalist does as much damage as a rebel. Possibly. We shall see. No! No! They hanged him above the gates of the town, where we could see him. I sent the company to cut him down, but they were mown down by gunfire. I hanged him before my eyes. Oh, Richard, my darling. I offered Robards any term of ransom for exchange. He gave no answer. And while I stood there, waiting, they strung him up above the gate. Tomorrow it might have been the same. A bullet through the head, a thrust from a pike. Look upon it as an act of war. Joseph died in your service. It was my fault. An error in judgment, the wrong decision. Joseph would forgive you. I can't forgive myself. Richard, cruelty begets cruelty. Betrayal gives birth to treachery. These are the qualities you have fostered in yourself these past years. I shall avenge him with every life I take. What? Not one of them shall be spared. I must have total command of the army. His Majesty made me general in the West, and by God, I swear that the whole world shall know it. Richard was constantly at Radford during the following six months. If you came to Buckland, I would not have to keep driving over to see you. But I refused. I lived with the fear that by sharing his life with too great an intimacy, I would become a burden to him. You lack humility. You are too proud to share the stigma of your condition with me, your lover. Still, I refused. And so a new year came. Plymouth, Lyme and Taunton were still unsubdued. I shall blockade Plymouth by land, so as to wear out the defenders by constant surprise attack upon the outward positions. In March, the attack began. In the west, a pall of smoke hung like a curtain in the sky. We heard that Parliament was forming a new model army. The Prince of Wales, only a lad of 15 years, was to bear the title of Supreme Commander of the West. March turned to April, and the Golden Gorse was in full bloom. And then, the news I dreaded. 
Richard gravely wounded in a battle at Taunton. Matty and I left immediately. Well, my dear, I still live. That is the only thing that matters. Hold my hand, Honor. I'll get some water. Oh, this is a good jest on the part of the Almighty. You and I are both smitten in the thigh. Does it pain you much? Pain? My God. Splinters from a cannonball striking below the groin. It burns something fiercer than a woman's kiss. Who has seen the wound? Every surgeon in the army, and each one makes more mess of it than his fellow. Come then, let's see what they've done with you. Careful, Matty. Hold my hand tight, Richard. Ah! Ah! Oh. Ah! Well, the wound is deep. You hurt me, bitch. Be quiet. It's clean, that's one thing. I fully expected to find it gangrenous. But you'll have some of those splinters to the end of your days unless you let them take your leg off. They'll not do that. I'd rather keep the splinters and bear the pain. It'll give you an excuse for your bad temper. Now, shall I wash the wound? Yes. Go on. Honour. I'm here. You know the commissioners of Devon are in Exeter at this moment with a list of complaints a mile long to launch at me. I did not know. It's all a plot hatched by your brother Robin. <gasps> as soon as I'm fit enough to move, I am to go before them. What do they want to do? Why, to have me shifted from my command, of course. Would you mind so very much? The blockade of Plymouth has not brought you much satisfaction. I'm not going to lie down and accept some secondary command dished out to me by the Prince's Council as long as I hold authority from His Majesty himself. Ow! Oh! <sighs> His Majesty appears by all accounts to have his own troubles. Who is this General Cromwell we hear so much about? Another goddamned Puritan with a mission. They say he talks to the Almighty every evening, but I think it's far more likely that he drinks. <laughs> He's a good soldier, though. His new model army will make mincemeat of our disorganised rabble. How is Dick? I sent him to France. Oh! Mm. Joseph was one in a million. But Dick, my son and heir, shudders when I speak to him and whimpers at the sight of blood. It does not make for pride in his father. There. That'll do for now. I shall dress the wound again in the morning. With less fuss, I hope. <sighs> you shall share a bottle of burgundy with us, Matty. No, thank you. I have better things to do. In five weeks, Richard was walking again, but the news was bad. On the 18th of June, the king was heavily defeated by General Cromwell and the rebel army was marching again towards the west. I had a letter from Robin imploring me to return to the Rashleys at Menabilly. And so, early in December, I set forth once again after 18 months for my brother-in-law's house at Menabilly. It is good to see you again, Honour. I hope the war ends swiftly. It may end swiftly, but not as you would wish it. They say that His Majesty is very hopeful. Oh, his Majesty is too preoccupied in keeping his own troops in the Midlands to concern himself about the West. Do you think Cornwall is likely to suffer invasion once again? I do not see how we are to avoid it. <sighs> Everything has been mismanaged. There is no supreme authority in the West to take command. You're forgetting Richard. <sighs> He has done himself irreparable harm here in Cornwall by commanding assistance rather than requesting it. <laughs> hard times require hard measures. It is no moment to go cap in hand for money to pay troops when the enemy is in the next county. Had he gone about his business with courtesy, the whole duchy would have rallied to his side. The weather was cold and dreary. It came hard to be alone again after eight months in company with the man I loved. I had shared his troubles and his fortunes. His moods were become familiar, loved and understood. The cruel quip and the sudden fleeting tenderness that would change him in one moment from the ruthless soldier to a lover. That Christmas it snowed and then the next attack came. This time I will not be innocent. 
I shall put supplies beneath the floorboards just in case a siege comes again. Our defences will withstand the rebels. We have a new musket with a longer barrel. What does Richard say? Will he attack and drive the rebels back to Dorset? A small <laughs> force of pressed men and volunteers against some 50,000 soldiers. But man for man, we are superior. <laughs> Everyone says have that. Have you not heard of Cromwell and the new model army? Do you not realise that never in England until now has there been raised an army like If it? we all talk in that fashion, we would have been beaten long ago. I suppose you've caught it from Richard. I do not wonder that he is unpopular. And then a letter came from Richard. You may be surprised to hear that I have written to the Prince of Wales, resigning from His Majesty's army. Men are deserting in their hundreds. Discipline is non-existent. This morning, I commanded a colonel to blow a bridge. He disputed my authority, saying his orders were to the contrary. His name, my dear honour, is Robin Harris. I cannot take orders from a man, he said, who would ruin the life and reputation of my sister. Such lunacy, such gross incompetence. Then I returned to Launceston to find that the Prince had appointed Lord Hopton and desires that I should serve under him as Lieutenant General of the Foot. They do not trust me. Therefore, I resign. I'm glad. It is an odd sensation, you know, to be at long last without responsibility. You should be happy. It will give me more time with you. Oh, Richard. Miss Honour! Oh, Miss Honour! What on earth is it, Matty? Bad news. They have arrested Sir Richard on a charge of disloyalty to the Prince and to His Majesty. <gasps> Where is he? In Launceston Castle. I must go to him. The governor says no one is to be admitted to see him. There are proclamations everywhere about the town that Sir Richard Grenville has been cashiered from every regiment he commanded and dismissed from His Majesty's army. But they cannot do that without court-martial. It is against every military code of tradition. Honour, you cannot stay here. I've come to take you back to Menabilly. Perhaps I have no wish to go, Robin. This is my home. You cannot remain here without protection. You can accompany me to Menabilly on my way to Truro. Truro is the headquarters of the council, is it not? The prince is there? Yes. Then if I go to Truro, there is a chance that I could have an audience with the prince himself. What is to be gained by that? I might be able to undo the damage you have done. Honour, please believe me that no action of mine had any bearing on his arrest. The whole arm is appalled. He is needed at this moment, more than any other man in Cornwall. Why did you not think of it before? Why did you refuse to obey his orders about the bridge? I lost my temper. You don't understand, Honour, what it's meant to me and all the family to have our name a byword in the county, to follow him from camp to camp like a loose woman. Is it so foul to love a man and go to him when he lies wounded? Why are you not married to him, then? If I am not Lady Grenville, it is because I do not choose to be so. You have no pride, then? No feeling for your name. My name is Honour, and I do not hold it tarnished. But my reputation is not important when Richard's life is at stake. What will happen to him? Imprisonment at His Majesty's pleasure, with a possible pardon at the end of the war. And what if the war does not go the way we wish, and the rebels gain Cornwall for Parliament? Well... Sir Richard Grenville is handed over as a prisoner and sentenced to death as a criminal of war. Think about it, Honour. Oh. Well, Matty, what do you think? They say nothing pleases the Prince better than a love affair. Perhaps when he hears your story and how you followed Sir Richard to Exeter, he may be willing to see you. Very well. Help me dress, Matty. Sir Richard's faults are many, sir, and I have not come to dispute them. But his loyalty to yourself has never, I believe, been in question. It's a wretched affair all round. Grenville is the one fellow who might have saved Cornwall. But I can't do anything about it. I am to be taken away to the Sillies for safety myself. There's one thing you can do, sir, if you will allow me to say so. What's that? Send word that when you sail for the Sillies, Sir Richard Grenville should be permitted to escape at the same time and commandeer a fishing boat for France. That way, he will be safely abroad and he will be able to call on his services at some future date. <laughs> that is a brilliant scheme. 
Sir Richard Grenville is most fortunate to have an ally such as yourself. <laughs> Sir Richard shall be free the instant we sail for the Sillies. Oh. And when I return, one day, I shall hope to see you both at Whitehall. <laughs> Two days later, Lord Hopton was defeated and the whole Western army in full retreat. The war in the West was over. Jonathan Rashley came down to fetch me back to Menabilly, no longer a camp follower, but plain Honor Harris, a cripple on her back. But it did not matter to me, for news came that Sir Richard Grenville had escaped to France. In the summer of 1646, Cornwall was the most wretched county in the kingdom. The harvest was still bad, the mines were closed, poverty and sickness were rife, and the plague reappeared. And yet, that first year of defeat was strangely quiet and peaceful to me. Danger was no more, the strain of war lifted. The man I loved was safe across the sea in France in the company of his son. But then, the rumours began. The royalists are arming, Miss Honour. Weapons are being smuggled into the country from France. There is talk of a leader landing in secret at Plymouth. Menabilly, once so full of life, now so desolate. Matty? Is that you? Matty? It's me, Honour. Who on earth? Dick! Oh! Oh, it is you. A beard. I shall be 18 in two months' time. You look wonderful. So grown. Is my father here? Your father? Why, no. Only I am here. Mary and Jonathan have gone to London. Yes, we knew that. That's why men are Billy has been chosen. Chosen? They will tell you when they come. My father and your brother Robin. Oh. And, of course, my Aunt Gartrid. Oh, Dick, tell me what is happening. We came to London, my father disguised as a Dutch merchant and I as his secretary. Since then, we have travelled England as secret agents for the prince. Finally, we came to Cornwall. Aunt Gartrid has fallen out with her parliamentary friends and was hot to join us. And your brother Robin also. Truly, the world has passed me by at Menabilly. I understand your brother has made himself Gartrid's bailiff. Well, that is his business. The muskets are being loaded and the sword sharpened. You will have a front seat at the slaughter. You sound bitter. Oh, Honour, I would give all I possess, which is precious little, to be out of it. Have you no faith that they will succeed? I have no faith in anything. I was happy in France. I begged Father to let me stay, but he would not. God in heaven, how I have come to loathe the very name of Grenville. <laughs> And they began to arrive. First Gartred, a little fuller in the bosom, her hair, which no longer gleamed gold but streaked with silver, making her look more lovely and more frail. Take my cloak, Robin. Certainly, my dear Gartred. You know my neighbour Ambrose Manerton, I think, Honour. Miss Harris? You and I seem fated to come together at moments of great crisis, Gartred. I have the consolation of knowing that for once we shall not be in opposition. Really? But it is only four years since you came here as a spy for Lord Robarts. If you doubt my loyalty, you must tell Richard. It's a strange power, this magnetism that you have for Richard. I give you full credit. Give me no credit, Gartred. Menabilly is but a name upon a map that will do as well as any other. An empty house, a nearby shore. And a secret hiding place into the bargain. The mint had the silver long ago. What are you playing for this time, Gartred? Perhaps I would like a third husband and security. My brother Robin cannot give it to you. You broke one man in my family. Take care that you do not seek to break another. You think you can prevent me? I only give you warning. Warning of what? You will never play fast and loose with Robin as you did with Kit. Robin is capable of murder. What prize for anyone looking for traitors? Have you been waiting long? Two years and three months. Pour me a glass of wine. Pour it yourself. Very well. Spitfire. Your health, everyone. 
Anna, where is your room? Robin and Gartred. Do you know about them? Have you turned prude, sweetheart, in your middle years? <laughs> Prudery be damned. My brother wants to marry her. I can see it in his eyes. Gartred will never throw herself away upon a penniless soldier. She has other fish to fry. You mean Ambrose Manerton? Of course. Ambrose has a pretty inheritance. Gartred would be a fool to let him slip from her. Send Gartred away. If Gartred goes, Ambrose will follow her. I can't afford to lose my treasurer. I thought so. Then send Robin packing. He will be no use to you if he continues drinking. Nonsense. Drink, in his case, is stimulation, the only way to ginger him. When the day comes, I'll ply him so full of brandy that he will take St Moore's Castle single-handed. Oh, Richard. Will you ever change? When the whole future of a country is at stake, emotions go overboard. Emotions, but not honour. Your resistance was stronger at 18. And your approach more subtle. It had to be in that confounded apple tree. <laughs> now, come here. <laughs> Saturday, the 13th day of May. The date for the Cornish rising. The daffodils bloom, the sea is glassy calm, the sky deep blue without a single cloud. Robin, I want you to ride and tell Jonathan Trelawney and his son about the rendezvous for the 13th. Sir. Have you no commands for me? Why, yes. I believe there must be some dolls in the attic. Why don't you go and fashion them some new dresses? You are insolent to your son, sir. One day you will provoke him once too often. That is my intention. Sometimes I think that after 20 years I know even less about you than I did when I was 18. Very probably. No father in the world would act as harshly to his son as you do to Dick. I only act harshly because I wish to purge his mother's whore blood from his veins. You're more likely to kindle it. Oh, Honour, my darling. Don't let's quarrel. When this campaign is over and we hold Cornwall for the Prince of Wales, I'll say goodbye to soldiering. I'll build a palace on the north coast near Stowe and live in quiet retirement like a gentleman. Oh, not you. You'd quarrel with all your neighbours. I'd have no neighbours save my own Grenville clan. Now, I shall carry you to bed. I'm tired and need your warmth. Who's there? Richard? Who is that? Where is she? Gertrude! Robin, what is it? I gave my message and then I returned. You've been drinking, Robin. So? Why has your sword drawn? What? Give it to me, Robin. You cannot fool me. Neither you nor Richard Grenville. This message was but a pretext to send me from the house. So Gertrude and Manerton could be together. That's nonsense, Robin, and you know it. Look, come and sit with me in my chamber. Let us talk for a while. No. No. They'll be together now. For God's sake, Robin, do not go into Gertrude's room. Reason with her in the morning if you must, but not now, not at this hour. I knew it. You come wet, could you? Oh, Robin. Robin. Yes. Oh. Richard. Richard, come quickly! This instant, hurry, please! Cold white moonlight pouring through the unshuttered window. Gartred with a crimson gash upon her face, clinging to the bed. Ambrose, his silken nightshirt, stained with blood. Look what you've done to my sister! And end to this before I end you! Damn you, Richard Grenville! Matthew! 
Water, bandage this quickly! Uh, and brandy! Uh, this is no time for any man to seek private uh, vengeance in a quarrel. I knew one thing. When I saw the gash on Gartred's face, I hated her no longer. We were even now. The following morning, Dick was absent from the breakfast table, but I gave no thought to it, for Robin had serious news. For God's sake, save yourselves. We're betrayed. What? Line upon line of them stretching down the road towards St. Austell. This is no chance encounter. The enemy are here in strength. Betrayed. There will be no rising. The Prince of Wales does not land this month in Cornwall. What are we to do? Who did this? Does it matter? Matter? Good God, you take it coolly. Remember four years ago, Gartred acting spy for Lord Robarts? Perhaps she is to blame. Dick. What must I do, Father? Will you do it for me? Or must I kill myself? That evening, the insurrection broke out in the West. What was to have been the torch to light all England was no more than a sudden quivering of flame spurting to nothing in the damp Cornish air. The rebellion of 1648, the last time men shall ever fight, please God, upon our Cornish soil. It lasted but a week, but for those who died and suffered, it lasted for eternity. There are troops gathered at the top of the hill, sir. If my father and I are found here by the enemy, will it be possible to prove to them that the Rashleys are innocent in the matter? I doubt it. You will have to hide. Hide? They will burn the place down. There is somewhere. Yes, there is a secret room. Dick knows. Would you condescend to share it with him, Richard? A hunted rat has no choice. No one has been there for four years. I remember it, Honour. Go then to the summer house and take your father. Hurry! I thought the hiding place was in the house, near your old apartment in the gatehouse. Did you? I did. You know, I could have stopped you from falling with your horse all those years ago. You knew that, didn't you? Yes. You called to me, and I misled you. On purpose. You did. It has taken a long time to call it quits, but I think now is the time. I have a pack of cards. We will play patience, you and I, until the troopers come. No one could have found a quieter couple than the two women playing cards in the dining hall at Menabilly. One with a great scar upon her face and silver hair, the other a hopeless cripple. Why were you left alone at Menabilly by the Rashleys, Miss Harris? Perhaps you have forgotten, Colonel Bennett, that my home at Lanrest was burned down four years ago. Why is Mrs Dennis from Orley Court a guest? She was once my sister-in-law, and we have long been friends. Is it true that your name has been connected with Sir Richard Grenville in the past? Indeed, it is. There are gossips in the West Country, as well as at Whitehall. Does Mrs Dennis know where her brother is? Uh, no. I have never been very friendly with my brother. I believe he is in Naples at the moment. Well, you appear to speak the truth, Mistress Harris. Pardon my indelicacy, madam, but that cut looks recent. An accident. A clumsy movement and some broken glass. Oh, surely not self-inflicted. What are you suggesting? It has the appearance of a sword cut. Were you a man, I would say you had fought a duel and received a hurt from an opponent. I'm not a man, Colonel. If you doubt me, why not come upstairs to my chamber and let me prove it to you? I thank you, madam. My eyes are sufficient evidence. I can think of no other officer in Cornwall, or even in Devon, who would decline to walk upstairs with Gartred Dennis. Whether you are Mrs Dennis or Mrs Harris does not greatly matter. What does matter is that your maiden name was Grenville. And so... And so I must ask you to come with me to Truro. There you will be held, pending investigation. As you will. You have some conveyance, I presume. 
I have no dress for riding. Mistress Harris, you are permitted to remain here until I receive further orders. The house must be searched and I shall leave a guard here. Good evening. You are ready, Mrs. Dennis? Yes, I am ready. I'm sorry to cut my visit short, Honour. Tell Jonathan what I said about the gardens. If he wishes to plant flowering shrubs, he must first rid himself of foxes. They are hard to catch, especially when they go underground. Smoke them out. It is the only way. Do it by night. They leave less scent behind them. Goodbye, Honour. Goodbye, Gartred. In my old room, one shutter hung limp from the window. The room had a dead, fusty smell. In the far corner lay the bleached bones of a rat. Matty, can you shift the stone? Uh, no, it is hard fixed. Have you forgotten that it only opens from the other side? We must kindle a fire, here against the wall. Perhaps the smoke will penetrate the cracks and make a signal. Oh, Lord! What if they're crouching in the tunnel at the farther end beneath the summer house? Oh, Matty, hurry! Hurry! Patience, patience. It's no good. Uh, Nothing is happening. Look! The stone is moving! Oh, thank God! Help move the stone. Uh, oh, I am scared, Matty. Uh, there! Richard! Dick, are you there? I feared you would not be here. A few hours more and it would have been too late. What do you mean? There is only room enough here for a dog to crawl. I've no great opinion of your rashly builder. Is Dick there? Yes, I'm here, Honour. Come. I will show you where we have been hiding. A jailer should have knowledge of the cell she puts her prisoners in. I will carry you down, Honour. And then I saw it for the first and the last time. Six foot high, four square, no larger than a closet. The stone walls felt clammy and cold to my touch. A stool against the corner, by its side an empty trencher with a wooden spoon, cobwebs and mould thick upon them. Above the stool hung the rope, frayed on its rusty hinge, and beyond this, the opening to the tunnel a round black hole about 18 inches high, through which a man must crawl and wriggle if he wished to reach the further end. I do not understand. It could not have been thus before. There must have been a fall of earth and stones from the foundations of the house. It blocks the tunnel, save for a small space through which we burrowed. Did I, in truth, force Dick to lie there hour after hour as a lad four years ago? God forgive me, but I thought to save his life. Take me back, Richard. What now? Well, there's nothing for it but to run our necks into cold steel, a dreary finish. Are you ready, Dick? Yours was the master hand that brought us to this pass. At least they keep a sharp axe in Whitehall. I've watched the executioner do justice before now. A little crabbed fellow he was last time I saw him, but with biceps in his arms like cannonballs. He only takes a single stroke, but the blood makes a pretty mess upon the straw. Oh, no. Hasn't he suffered enough these 18 years? What, do you turn against me too? Stop it! I have made friends with a sentry on the causeway, Sir Richard. For a price, he can find you a fishing boat. She has it. We'll sail to Holland, from Holland to France, and once there to see the prince. What do you think, Dick? Do we go the same way by which we came? The house is guarded. It is your only chance. I'll go then and speak to the sentry, shall I? Be careful, Matty. And when the watchdogs come tomorrow and seek to sniff our tracks, how will you deal with them? Dry timber in midsummer burns easily and fast. I think the family rashly will not use their summer house again. And the entrance here? The stone cannot be forced from this side. See the rope there on the hinge? I shall break the rope. There. No one will ever force the stone again once you have closed it. Go first, Dick. 
and I will follow you. Goodbye, Honor. Be brave. The journey will be swift. Once safe in Holland, you will make good friends. Be careful. Goodbye, Anna. How long this time, Richard? Two years. Perhaps eternity. When I come back, we'll build that house at Stowe. You shall sink your pride at last to become a Grenville. We shall see. I'll do your destruction for you. Watch from your chamber in the eastern wing, and you will see the Rashley summer house make its last bow to Cornwall. Do you still love me, Honor? For my sins, Richard. Are there many? You know them all. You know why Dick betrayed you to the enemy? Not from resentment, not from revenge, but because he saw the blood on Gartred's cheek and remembered what you did to his mother. Forgive him, Richard, for my sake, if not for your own. I have forgiven him, but the Grenvilles are strangely fashioned. I think you will find that he cannot forgive himself. I waited through the night in my room. At length, I saw a little spurt of flame rising above the trees in the park. I imagined two figures wending their way across the Cowry beach and waiting in the shelter of the cliff. They were safe. They were together. The next day, Jonathan returned. Robin is uh, detained in Plymouth, but I think they can fasten little upon him. When it's all blown over, he'll be released on condition that he takes the oath of allegiance to Parliament, as I was forced to do. And then? Why, then he can become his own master and settle down to peace. I have a little house that would suit him well, and you too, Honour, if you should wish to share it with him. That is, if you have no other plan. No. I have no other plan. And I have news from my fishing friends. A lobster fisherman found a passenger waiting on the beach below the causeway. One passenger? Why, yes. I thought you'd be pleased. Is anything the matter? No. There is nothing the matter. As the passenger was put aboard the vessel, he gave the fisher lad a piece of rope and bade him hand it on his return to me. There, there was a piece of paper wrapped about it. Here. Dear Honour, I am on my way to France. I have to tell you that Dick, the least of the Grenvilles, chose his own way to do penance. Ever your Richard. Do you understand it? Yes, Jonathan. I understand it. Well, it's over, praise heaven. There is nothing more we can do. No. Nothing more we can do. Come now, take heart. One day the king will come into his own again. One day your Richard will return. One day... When the snow melts, when the thaw breaks, when the spring comes.
In the year 1824, I, Mr. William Rashley of Menabilly, had certain alterations made to my house. The architects noticed that the buttress against the northwest corner of the house served no useful purpose. When the masons demolished it, they came upon a stair leading to a small room. Here they found the skeleton of a young man seated on a stool, dressed in the clothes of a cavalier as worn during the period of the Civil War. I gave orders to have the secret room bricked up so that no one in the house should come on it in the future. The King's General was written by Daphne du Maurier and dramatized for radio by Micheline Wanda. Honor was played by Catherine Harrison, Richard by Roger Allen, Matty by Carolyn Pickles, and Robin by Philip Sully. Gartred was played by Geraldine Fitzgerald, Mary Rashley by Sally Edwards, Young Dick by Gary King, and Older Dick by David Thorpe. Jonathan Rashley was played by Peter Penry Jones, Lord Robarts by Jonathan Adams, and the Colonel and William Rashley by John Fleming. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The King's General was directed by Cherry Cookson.